Okay, so we'll start any moment from now. Yes. The groups are divided into four. Okay. Thank you. is 4.30. Should we start or wait for like five minutes? I think we should start. It's okay. fine. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sewe Se. I'm a lawyer and a mediator. I'm based in Abuja. Okay, so I'll start with um, a brief highlight of the program, what it's about, and then the objectives as well. Okay. Okay, so the Gypsy and Internship Program. It's a quarterly intellectual property mentorship program for law students, young lawyers, and intellectual property across Africa. Please, may I confirm if you can all hear me? Yes. All right, so I'll go ahead. So mentees are afforded the opportunity to assess valuable intellectual property advice, training, networking, mentorship, internship, discussion forums, industry updates, and resource materials from experienced IP mentors. This program seeks to encourage continuous intellectual property training, development, and evolution in Nigeria, Africa, and around the world. So you can watch our videos by searching the, um, using the hashtag Gypsy MIP, that's mentorship, internship, mentorship and internship program on all social media channels as YouTube, Facebook, and all others. Okay, so the objectives of the program, I'll go to the objectives of the program now. One objective of, of the program is to provide easy access to intellectual property guidance, train and resource materials for students, young lawyers, and IP enthusiasts in Africa. Then it also facilitates dialogue and network among experienced and less experienced intellectual property practitioners and stakeholders. The program also transforms mentees into intellectual property mentors and leaders for the next generation of mentees. And it also facilitates further intellectual property mentorship, internship, scholarships and IP related job placements for the mentees. Okay, so we'll go right ahead to um, the presentation um, from the mentees. So the mentees are divided into four groups and we'll start with um, the presentation from group one. So I don't know if group one is ready for their presentation. A representative from group one. And each group has five minutes to present. So please take note of the time. Okay, so if group one is not ready, we'll go straight ahead to group two. Is group two ready? Okay, please go ahead. You have five minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Please share your screen. But if you can't do that, it's still okay. You can just go into your presentation. Okay, I'm on it already. Just a minute. All right. Please 
is if divine is not ready, we can hear from group three or group four so that we can save time. Okay. Diva, you can just go ahead with the presentation while you try to share your screen. Okay, I think if another group is ready, they can just go straight. Um, so that I don't get distracted whereas I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. So group three. Three ready. Or group four. Well, I think that we can just skip this and go um, straight to the guest. Mentors. We'll take that later. All right. We'll start with um, we have two guest mentors for today. And um, we have Mr. Okay, so our first guest mentor for today is Mr. Dozier. Is taking us on intellectual property assessment and management. I will just read his profile briefly and then hand over to him to begin his presentation. So, Mr. Dozier studied law at the University of Joss and was called to the Nigerian Bar in the year 2012. He currently works as an associate at O Kayode and Co., where he practices law in the areas of intellectual property prosecution and maintenance, anti-counterfeiting, enforcement, corporate slash commercial law, advertising law, and legal advisory departments, respectively. Dossier is a member of a number of professional associations, among which include the Nigerian Bar Association, the Intellectual Property Lawyers Association of Nigeria, International Trademarks Association and the Nigerian Bar Association's IP section on business law. Mr. Dozier has been ranked for many years as a rising star and more recently rated as a notable practitioner by managing intellectual properties IP stars, a global ranking service which ranks IP practitioners and contributors around the world. He currently serves as a member of the Trademark Office Practices Subcommittee at INTA, that's the International Trademarks Association. Mr. Dozier, you are welcome, sir. We're glad to have you today. So Good over evening. to you, sir. Good evening. Thank you very much for having me do this presentation. So um, to start, I think I'll just share my screen because I put together a very brief um, presentation for today. So let me just share my screen now. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Yes, sir, we can see your screen. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'm going to make this presentation as um, elementary as possible. And I'll be quite fast because I'm sure the time is, is, is very limited, 10 to 15 minutes thereabouts. So let me start by um, describing what um, IP assets are. The topic is um, IP assessment and management, that's intellectual property assessment and management. And, but to proceed, we first need to understand what IP assets are. And I'm sure as students of um, intellectual property or persons who are interested in intellectual property, we all know what intellectual property assets are. And I can describe them as um, collections of intellectual properties like patents, trademarks, industrial designs in other jurisdictions, geographical indications, trade secrets, etc. These um, IP assets are actually intangible rights that are strategically chosen by you know, 
business corporations, private um, um, entities, even nations as well, countries, for their business value in most cases. These IP assets have economic value because of their ability to enhance um, financial returns. For example, technological devices, inventions, um, products that are sold under particular trademarks or service marks, services, rendered under those service marks. So IP assets have the capacity to attract them um, huge economic benefits to their owners. For example, an owner of a, an invention in which a patent right lies can decide to license the rights to use that invention for a fee. Also, we have um, owners of trademarks who may grant them um, registered user rights to the owners, I mean, to persons who are interested in dealing in those products for a fee as well. People can also decide to, as owners of intellectual property rights, can also decide to assign their IP rights for a consideration. And I, I can also say that in the long run, these IP rights are capable of, um, for example, trademarks in particular, they can help companies retain customer loyalty because of the popularity or the uniqueness of that brand. And IP assets are in today's world, major drivers of you know, economic development worldwide. And because of this, they are increasingly becoming more popular. So um, I believe, I don't need to say too much about this because of time constraints, but um, it is also important to say that there's a growing recognition globally of um, intangible assets. These intangible assets uh, is just simply another word for intellectual property. Uh, they, they've become some of the most valuable elements in you know, national and regional economies worldwide. And for this reason, a lot of um, policymakers in governments, in research institutes, our universities, in private um, institutions, they are clamoring right now for the development of a, of, of let me say, national IP policies. I understand because I've attended a few meetings where um, IP stakeholders and lawyers in Nigeria are pushing strongly for the development of a national IP policy. And in saying, let me, let me just explain what I mean by national IP policy for people who are listening and may not really have an idea of what it is. The, an IP policy is simply like principles and guidelines that you know, establish methods of effectively managing intellectual property assets. We talk about a lot of things, including ownership of IP rights, um, use of these rights, um, incentives for researchers. We talk about um, methods of you know, commercialization of these IP assets talk about conflict of interest as regards ownership, a lot of things. So policymakers in many nations today and you know, governments are beginning to see the need to you know, develop a national IP policy. So moving on, let me just you know, start from IP assessment because the topic is IP assessment and management. But to understand how to manage your IP, you first need to conduct an assessment. And as the word goes, assessment, what does it mean to assess something, to evaluate, to maybe analyze? That's simply what it means. So um, one of the major ways by which um, an IP, IP assessment is done is through IP audits. And we, I'm sure we know what an audit is. IP audit is a major tool in assessing intellectual property. It can, and it can generally be described as, you know, an exercise conducted with the aim of collating as much information as possible about existing and prospective rights as possible. And when conducting an IP audit, it should cover all aspects of your, you know, intellectual property and should focus on, you know, 
flagship products of the particular company that is conducting this um, IP audit. It's conducted an audit of, you know, IP assets can be conducted for many reasons. For example, if the company, if the intention of the company is to protect its brand, you know, trademarks, IP, IP assets like trademarks and domain names will be the focus for that particular IP audit. Or if the company is um, focusing on protecting technological inventions, um, assessing the stability and value of its patents will be you know, more in focus. Or if the company is looking to you know, assess market freedom of a particular product that has been patented, then they'll be looking at the, the audit to be centered around the risk of infringement. So different methods of IP audits exist. They may take in different, like the form of maybe a simple list of existing IP assets, like, you know, taking down the number of patents and trademarks that you have on record. It might even take the form of identification of technology or maybe cultural industries that may be sources of intellectual property listing down research institutions that you know you would like to work with or license your IP assets to. Um, it may even just take the form of um, collating data and statistics on you know different ventures that you would like to partner with. So there are different elements of an IP, of IP audits. And some of these elements focus on explaining what needs to be taken into consideration when doing an IP audit. And for, for example, in, in the identification, in, in the conduct of an IP audit, you need to identify existing rights as well as other relevant assets in maybe the different departments of that particular institution or company. For example, rights that may spring from project, ongoing projects, rights that may spring from um, research and development, you know, things like that. Then when conducting an IP audit, it's also important to identify the ownership status applicable to each IP asset or IP rights that you, you have. Um, all you need to do is to maybe go through the applicable law and see who owns what right. For example, if um, a there's a pharma, let me use a pharmaceutical company now as for for example, an employee of a pharmaceutical company would most likely invent or invent something in the process of carrying out his official duties while at work. Most likely in his contract of employment, it will be contained there in that any such invention he develops while carrying out his official duty will belong to the company. So if you peruse the applicable laws, which is you know patents, trademarks, act, and his contract of employment as well, you would be able to identify who exactly owns these um, IP rights. You also need to, in conducting an IP audit, you also need to identify um, existing licensing agreements and how you can transfer, how these um, license agreements can, how they work, how to go about doing this. Then you can also you know, set, set up a comprehensive documentation on which rights are owned, which rights require protection, which rights are owned by third parties, things like that, then you also need to establish docu a documentation on ongoing research, which is likely to produce um, patentable or protectable subject matter. So IP, why now in talking about um, IP, audits and IP management. These are not, I would say that these are not strange or foreign concepts to us. And they are not separate or distinct from each other. 
you to be able to manage your intellectual property assets, you need to conduct an assessment. And that was why I talked about IP assessments better through IP audits. So now I'm moving on to IP management as quickly as I can. And we asked the question, why IP management? Why exactly do we need to manage our intellectual property assets? And we need to do this for many reasons. To, for example, to facilitate you know, the organization of IP assets so that they can be better exploited. And IP management has, has grown to become you know, a primary concern of private enterprise, especially in the tech world, because there are a lot of new inventions, a lot of new technologies that come out. So many intellectual property rights are attached to these new inventions and they would need to be, to be protected. And in today's world, we also have um, online courses that for intellectual property management, known as IPM or intellectual asset management. And what is, um, what is IP management? That's a question that we need to answer. IP management can simply mean you know, the administration and organization of intellectual property matters in institutions such as companies, public or private research institutes, and maybe any other entity that is engaged in the creation and commercialization of intangible rights. And in managing your intellectual property, you require um, a centralized organization for overseeing the creation and you know, commercial exploitation of intangible rights. Basically, what it means is managing IP assets that may have commercial value or that may be required for facilitating future exploitation. That's simply what IP management means. And the protection of and, and management of intellectual property assets has become a commercial imperative requiring you know, the development of a set of practices that are encompassed within the field of intellectual property management, as I talked about earlier. So there are certain aspects of intellectual property management that we also need to, I would love, need to talk about. Yes, in there is um, the aspect of monitoring rights. Yes. It has to be an ongoing process. You keep on monitoring whether rights have been developed, which rights are in existence presently, which rights are likely to come into existence, which rights are in the process of being developed as one aspect. Um, when you have developed these rights, you now establish ownership of these rights. Who owns these rights? Is it the employer? Is it the employee? Who exactly owns these rights? We need to, we need to collate and document these existing rights which you have you know, identified. Collate them, document them, then Documentation, it also involves documentation and preparation of licensing contracts and other agreements for, you know, transfer, the deeds of assignment and the rest. Then documentation of ownership aspects, such as valuation of these rights. How do, how do these rights, what value do these rights have in the marketplace? You need to put that into consideration as well. In managing your IP. So we also have a um, structure of IP management. Now this structure, in talking about structure of um, IP management, it's simply about um, what IP management should look like, what, what form should it take. And I'm just going to explain very briefly. IP management Will, should necessarily involve um, inventory taking of existing IP rights. You take in, conduct an inventory of what rights exist, what rights belong to the company at that point in time, documentation of these rights and continuous monitoring of rights that may be developed. 
Mm. IP management also involves um, facilitation of you know decision making processes with people like researchers, IP developers, scientific, and maybe even academic staff who carry out a lot of research and stand the chance of developing intellectual property. Then the formulation of IP policies for companies, internal IP policies are very important because they provide them a guideline as to how to deal with these IP assets. Then management of IP also involves protection of these rights, protection through registration and you know, maintenance, making sure that these rights are kept in force, that they do not lapse because any right, any IP right that has lapsed is as good as um, non-existent. So it has to be constant, you know, the, co the, the company has to be constantly vigilant to ensure that the rights are protected and maintained, they are enforced. And IP management also involves the detection of, you know, potential commercial partners. Who do we think we can partner with to commercially exploit these um, IP rights that we have identified and we've documented. Um, constant monitoring of these rights is, is very important. Then in IP management, it's also important to mention the fact that um, today there are a lot of softwares that can be used to you know, conduct IP management and companies are advised to, you know, acquire some of these um, softwares and deploy them in the use of, you know, managing their intellectual property because they make the process of IP management easier. Like some of these softwares are enabled to send reminders, reminders for maybe renewal due dates or things like that. So this is important to mention this as well. So um, this question is actually very important. Are there any advantages of IP management? And I would say yes, there are advantages. And some of these, some of the advantages of IP management include them um, providing knowledge and awareness of you know, the company's existing um, IP rights, which would also inform you as to the net worth of that company in terms of its intangible assets. And it's the ability to quickly and very easily retrieve um, information on IP assets if you have properly managed them. And it's all, it also becomes easier to check, you know, the risk of infringement to your IP assets. Like earlier in the presentation, I said if the companies and um, focus is, you know, assessing market freedom of a particular um, invention of patented product, for example, the focus would be on, you know, assessing infringement risk. So if, you, if you've done your assessment and, you know, you've taken steps to proper, properly manage your intellectual property assets, then to be very easy to, you know, determine and maybe even forestall potential infringements of your IP rights. Then yet yeah, one of the one other advantage of IP management is um, the easy identification and logging of developing and potential IP assets, particularly in tech companies and companies that do a lot of research and innovation. And it also IP management also encourages innovation through um, tech software development for IP management. For example, comp there are companies who focus solely on developing or building these softwares that are used to manage intellectual property. So it creates a market for this type of these companies as well. And okay, so I think this is my last slide. This is my last slide. So in, in summary, I'll just say um, IP assessment and management is very important for companies 
and in academic institutions, research institutions, technology, you know, institutions is very important because it helps them to put their house in order and know what exactly do we have in terms of intellectual property rights, intellectual property assets. What do we have? What are they worth? How can they be protected? How can they be maintained? How can they, how, how can we exploit these rights? It's very important, it makes it easier. And I think with that, I'll just say, um, that is IP, IP assessment and IP management is important. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Josie. That was amazing and excellent presentation. Thank you so much for saying yes to the invitation and for coming. Um, and things I must say um, about your presentation, aside from the fact that it has so much um, things packed into it, and you are a very soft spoken person. So it's something that, as you are saying it, you're just thinking inside. Thank you, sir. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Back to Thank you. So our next um, guest mentor for today is Mr. Max Ekombe. He taking us to the next venture. So I'll go ahead and read out his profile briefly. Taking us on intellectual property and sports. So, Mr. Max Ikombe is the founder and principal of Everlaw Associates. He works extensively in the fields of arbitration, ICT, technology law, and intellectual property law. Max is a facilitator on the annual information technology. Sorry. Okay, so I'll go ahead. Max is a facilitator on the annual information technology and, and the law, the law course of the Nigeria Institute of Advanced Legal Studies since 2016. He has trained in advanced intellectual property law courses at the World Intellectual Property Organization Academy, and he's an accredited agent of the Nigerian Trademark and Patents Registry. He has conducted IP registration business there since 2010. So Mr. Max, you are welcome. We're glad to have you on this session. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Um... Uh, thank you, Juliana, as always, for having me over. And I also want to acknowledge my colleague, um, Mr. Dozier, for a very insightful presentation on IP management. So I'm speaking on uh, IP and exports, and I think uh, I must commend the organizers for, organize, for arranging it this way, because what Mr. Dozier has spoken about is largely the foundation on which um my own talk would come because when a person uh you know of course when you have your you, you have a company being run and you have acquired IP assets and of course Mr. Duzier has given us a good uh, background as to why apologies uh, you know as I start off please I don't have presentations I'll just speak and I'll try my best to keep within my allotted time so I suspect I have 15 minutes right so I, I should finish by 15 past um five so I'll just speak freely to the topic, um, like I said, with uh, the foundation already laid by, uh, by, by Mr. Duzier. So the idea is, yeah, when a company has uh, IP assets, of course, how do you know you have IP assets? And Mr. Duzier has told us you do, you know, you do a proper, you know, IP audit to ensure you, you know what your IPs are, your IP assets are, uh, you know which is valuable, and you understand how those IP assets form a basis for your business. So by the time your business begins to expand, of course, it's always um, natural that any business wants to grow and um, cross the borders and begin to trade internationally. But however, there are dangers to trading internationally. 
because when a company um, you know is domiciled in its own home country, it has uh, done an IP you know it has a proper IP management structure in place where it ensures that all its relevant IP products are registered and otherwise the ones that can be registered like trade secrets are properly protected through adequate um, protection measures. So the next thing is when that same business wants to cross the borders and operate in other countries, of course, the question to be asked is, and which goes out to is the territoriality of IP rights. So IP rights are only, um, well, let me use the word valid in quotes, within the country where they are registered. So it means in a sense, there's no international IP system. Yeah, there are some international protocols and agreements and treaties that allow you know, um, for recognition, for multi-jurisdictional recognition of IP rights. But even at the base of those um, treaties and agreements, it's still the underlying uh, principle that IP rights are territorial. So if you want your IP rights protected in any country, you have to go to that country and get the IP rights registered. And as we are aware, for some IP rights, you don't have forever to register them. Some you have forever to register them. So for instance, if you have a trademark, you're already trading with, say, in Nigeria, uh, well, even if um, 20 years from now you choose to enter the, um, the U.S. market, you can always go there, assuming no one else has um, taken out a similar trademark, you can reach out your trademark and get the exclusive rights that the trademark confers on you in the U.S. market. But for instance, for patents, it doesn't work that way. So patents, uh, and that is because when it comes to patents, they test for novelty. Novelty just means newness. Before you are allowed to register a patent, the invention in question must be new. So the test for newness is a global test. So it simply means that if you have registered your patent in Nigeria and you take no steps to immediately using any of the international agreements, such as uh, the Paris uh, Convention, which gives you 12 months to register the, the same patent in the US, or for instance, if you are using the Madrid um, agreement or the Madrid system, which allows you an elongated time period of 18 months, if you don't activate any of those mechanisms to register your patent in the US, that means that after that period of time, you, you lose protection. You can't register your patent in the US anymore. So these are the reasons why it's important that there's a proper IP management uh, system in place that helps you pick out these differences and understand what are your, you know, and of course, IP management helps you also to tie your IP strategy to your business objectives. So by the time you have your maybe five-year business plan that tells you, look, our next frontier for growth is Asia then it means you, you know, your part of your IP management uh, audit is to immediately begin to check out what are the requirements for getting protection for your IP in the relevant uh, Asian countries you hope to uh, begin to export your goods to. So of course you need to take the necessary steps. So like I said, if it's for patents, then you don't have you know, the luxury of waiting. You have to activate one of the international agreements immediately and ensure you get your patent registered you know, in those countries. If it's for trademarks, yeah, you might have some more time. Of course, for some other measures like trade secrets are more typically, these are governed more by contractual agreements. So you are sure that when you have identified the partner, you know, maybe a joint venture agreement with an Asian company to export into Asia, then you put all the necessary agreements in place, confidentiality agreements, non-disclosure agreements, just to ensure that once you make your technology known to them, they will not steal your technology and, and begin to use it uh, behind you. So there are, are a variety of uh, ways you can do this. But like I said, you must always be in mind that the basic uh, principle is that your IP rights are only territorially enforced. However, a, an interesting question I always get particularly when it comes to patents is, if patents are territorially um, enforceable, does it mean I have my patent in Nigeria, somebody else can go to maybe the US market, register the same patent, and then I try to export into US and it would stop me? No, it doesn't work exactly that way. Like I explained to you earlier, the global test for novelty to get a patent uh, uh, registered is a global, you know, it means that that invention has not been disclosed anywhere in the world. So if I have my patent registered in Nigeria in 2015, and I choose to export into the US market in 2020, and some company comes up and says, look, no, we have this patent already registered in the US, you can't import or export into the US market. And I could use my patent, I mean, and assuming their own patent was registered in 2000, I can use my own patent from Nigeria in 2015 to modify the grant of the own patent by showing that, look, this invention you registered in 2020 
my, my apology, sorry, a voice call came into my line. I hope you can hear me now. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can. Okay, apologies. Yes, voice sir, call. Can hear you. Okay, yeah. so sorry. So we'll just continue. So, so like I mentioned, so it means if I have my patent application registered earlier, technically it doesn't mean that patent grants me the exclusive rights that the patent holder in the US has. But what it means is that my patent registered in Nigeria allows me to stop anyone else from registering a similar patent anywhere in the world because my patent has disclosed that invention. So what it simply means is that for the US market, then it means I have to compete with that person. So he can get an exclusive right, I can get an exclusive right. We both just have to use our patented technology and compete you know, against each other without anyone having the upper hand of the exclusive 20 year monopoly that a patent right gives. So like I said, these are the reasons why you ought to carefully um, look at your, 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 your export, your, your plans when you want to export. So another important uh, aspect of exporting, of course, is that typically um, when you export your goods or services, it's usually wiser to, to get a partner in the foreign country who, of course, understands local market conditions, who might already have um, a good established uh, sales uh, channel and network in that country who has already maybe some financial capacity, and sometimes also just to comply with local uh, digitalization policies. So for instance, if you are exporting uh, goods or services into the Nigerian downstream uh, oil and gas sector, or some parts of the oil and gas sector because of our um, local content development um, act, well, that's not the exact name, but what that does is that it just simply says, look, only Nigerians are allowed to play in certain parts of the Nigerian oil and gas industry. So sometimes it is because of those kinds of requirements, you need to find a local partner who you partner with when you enter into that market. So when you do that, there are many ways to structure that deal. So one of the ways is to give a license to that local partner to, you know, otherwise, because I mean, what your, your IP rights confess on is the exclusive right to use, to import, to produce, to market, to sell those goods. So you can appoint that local partner, grant him a license that allows him, you know, of course, within the parameters of what the license agreement says to do those things. But remember that you can't grant somebody a license where you have not properly registered the intellectual property. So for instance, if it's a trademark, if the trademark has not been registered, then you can't grant a license. Save for the fact that you can grant a license and say, look, part of the things granted in this license is the right to register the trademark in your local jurisdiction as a registered user and use it. And also another caveat with licenses is that you have to be very specific and granular on those agreements. Those agreements have to be specific on exactly what rights the local partner has. So the right to manufacture the products or the right to only import the products from your factory or the right to set up a factory there. And then also another important aspect you must always watch out for is what of improvements made by the local partner who owns the IP rights. So for instance, the local partner has been able to customize the product, so for instance, you have a Nigerian product, you move it to say Norway, Norway is a very cold and temperate region, and the person you know, is able to add some knowledge that's even an invention and it's patent worthy that makes those products that are ordinarily designed for hot, humid climate of Nigeria to work in the cold, uh, frigid temperatures of Norway. Now, who owns the right to that improvement? These are things that have to be specified clearly in, in the, the, the licensing uh, agreement. Another important thing to also watch out for when it comes to IP and exports also that we must know that at the end of the day, you know, there's what we call nationalism. Every country has that patriotic sense where they want their own citizens to, you know, to, to be wealthy and to do well. So most countries will pass, you know, funny laws or create exemptions where their own citizens are able to access your IP. So for instance, a typical one would be um, what we call a compulsory license. So we have that going on now in respect to COVID vaccines. South Africa is leading the charge and pushing at the World Trade Organization for flexible rules to be created to allow African countries um, grant compulsory uh, licenses for pharmaceutical companies to utilize the patent and you know, the formulation of uh, COVID vaccines. So that's also a risk that you know, your, your IP audit should take into consideration. And Mr. Uh, you know, who spoke before me also mentioned about what we call the freedom to operate. So freedom to operate search is essentially a due diligence or an audit where you check in that market. How, you know, what, what, what are different IP rights in that market? And, you know, if I move into this market with my products, am I going to have the freedom to operate or would I be infringing on someone else's uh, IP rights and would I be sued for it? So it would, of course, sometimes mean that you have to change your brand product. So that's why I see some brands, they are the same, but they have different names across in different countries. So for instance, 
I produce products in Nigeria, I want to import them into the US, and I find that someone else is already using the brand name of my products in the US, then I might have to change and use a different branding just so I could get a trademark registered in the US. So all these are things that you must carefully look at uh, you know, when you, when you set out to export into uh, new markets. Like I said, you must always be careful in your agreements with, with, uh, with your local partners. So sometimes, oh, of course, another huge uh, area of um, uh, IP and exports is franchising. So franchising simply is a system where you allow other businesses to use your, your bundle of IP rights to offer goods or services that are exactly identical to your own goods or services so that anybody experiencing those goods or services have exactly the same experience they have when they come to your own store. So one of the easiest places to see this is of course in the quick service restaurant, business home, um, KYC for instance, is it K uh, KFC, sorry. KFC Kentucky Fried Chicken is in Nigeria now. It's a franchise from the KFC of the US. Domino's Pizza is the same thing as well. So it's all similar principles. There's a franchise agreement which essentially is a specialized type of licensing agreement that licenses a bundle of IP rights. So it could be your patents, your trademarks, your trade secret, also your trade dress. Trade dress is very important, I like for restaurants. The color of your chairs, the color of your table, the shape of your cutlery, the shape of your plates, the uniform that the, 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 the workers in the outlet wear, the way the, the storefront looks and all. These are all parts. So some of them can be protected by trademark, some of them not exactly, so they can be protected by uh, confidentiality agreements or non compete agreement. So there are lots of ways to protect these things. But essentially, when your client is beginning to export into foreign markets, there's a lot of work to be done. You don't take for granted that we have already protected our rights in our country. So if we go there, no one else can infringe on that. That, that would be a wrong assumption. So I think with this, I'm out of time. So I'll end at this point and I'll welcome questions. Okay. Thank you. And then back to you, say I guess. Thank you so much, sir. That was very insightful. So I'll go ahead to take questions from the mentees. Um, I'll start with um, Olua Busola. If you are ready, let's have your question. Okay, if Olua Busola is not ready, let's go to NECA. Neka, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Maybe we'll just throw it open. So if you have a question, you can just unmute yourself and ask if you're listening to us. Okay, blessed, please. Good evening, Ma. Good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. Um. According to the um, so far, if I just start, thank you, Mr. Mas, for your question so far. Registration of um, IP assets in Nigeria, for example, now, let's say I registered mine in 2015, and someone registered his own, for example, in China in 2019. Does that give me, even though I didn't register my rights over in China subsequently, but does that give me an advantage over that particular individual, or does it depend on the laws of that? Or does it be on the IP laws of China? I don't know if you get me, sir. Yeah, yeah, I do. I get your question. Yeah, it, it's um, right. it's an important question. Sorry, sir. Yes. Um, let's just try and take the questions, the questions. together, so okay, that we can pass together. Then let us ask the question to both Mr. Dozier and Mr. Max. So, if okay. you have any question. Mr. Dozier, you can ask. If you have any question for Mr. Max, you can also ask. Just um, try to unmute yes. yourself and ask a question. I have another question now. Okay, what are the procedures for registration in uh, like say, international registration? That's the question, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Blessed. I'll see you on the way. Yes, um, good afternoon. Okay, I, I have questions for both, um, both of the speakers. The first one for Mr. Dozier. Um, earlier, while he was speaking about um, IP assets, assessments and management, and the question I had then was um, about IP management. What are the rules of nations? Because um, last week we learned about um, African um, continental free trade agreement 
and AV agreement. And in that sense, it was a supernatural and um, supernational agreements to cover IP um, regulations across nations. Those um, agreements like ACFCTA, does it um, cover IP assessments and management between nations? And I guess this question also applies to IP exports. So let me reiterate, the question here is um, for IP assessment and management, how do nations, sorry, how do nations um, oversee IP management. Then for Mr. Max, my question is about uh, IP exports. How does an international um, IP agreement like or a trade market like AFCTA, how does it affect IP exports? Thank you. Thank you, Omotai. Is there any other person with a question? Then please unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Before we are waiting for any more questions, please, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Mrs. Uche. She's around. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Ayokunle. They are also mentors here, and we are excited to have them. I'm sure that once the guest mentors are through with their answers, that they would also like to say things to, to the mentees. So um, you're welcome, sir, you're welcome. Uh, we'd also be expecting to hear from you at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, over to Blessed. You, are, you wanted to ask a question? Yes, ma. Okay. I didn't get the I didn't get the proper grabs of the definition of IP, IP management. Earlier, that's for the first speaker, ma. Okay, thank you. Okay, so is there any other person with a question? If there are no more questions, we'll proceed. Okay. I can see that Jane is here. I can see Opeulua. I can see Omotoye. I can see Neka. I can see Divine. I can see Blessing. Please, it's very important that you ask questions. You're not just here to listen. You're also here to interact and to try to um, talk to. So please, we'd also like to get questions from you. So just think about something that you can ask. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Okay, so um, while we're waiting for more questions, um, we welcome Mr. Dozier to starts um, with answering questions for his own session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you very much, um, Suese. And um, I believe the first question that was addressed to me is, um, what is the role of nations in you know, overseeing IP management, if I'm correct? Okay, so my answer will be that in order for, I mean, nations, need to develop a national IP policy. It's very, very important because otherwise they would not have a particular position on you know, how to effectively manage intellectual property. Nigeria, for example, does not yet have an, an IP policy and a lot of stakeholders and legal practitioners have been pushing for this to happen and during my presentation, I explained earlier what an IP policy helps to do, what it is and what it enables nations to do. Um, and I'll say it again. An IP policy is simply, you know, guidelines and maybe principles on how to effectively manage intellectual property assets. And they provide for a lot of, a lot of areas, including um, ownership of these IP rights, um, the right to use these um, IP rights it provides for you know incentives for innovators who come up with you know a lot of inventions that have IP rights attached to them. It covers um, um, let me say commercialization of these IP rights. How can you exploit these um, IP rights? How can you you know commercialize them? It talks about um, conflict of interest as per you know ownership of these IP rights. 
So the best way, the best way for, let me say, a country to effectively um, manage its, its intellectual property assets is to develop a national IP policy because our laws are not enough. In Nigeria, for example, we have very you know, outdated legislation that we are still relying on in you know, administering intellectual property assets. So that's the answer to question one. I think question two was um, about the definition of um, IP management. And I say IP management simply, can, it can be defined as the administration and organization of intellectual property matters in institutions um, such as companies, you know, public or private research institutions, um, even countries as well, nations, governments, and any other, any other entity that is engaged in the creation and commercialization of intangible rights. That's just the definition I give. Administration and organization of IP matters in all these institutions that are engaged in the creation and commercialization of these intangible rights. So I believe those are my responses. Thank you, Thank you so much, sir, for the response to the questions. So we'll move over to Mr. Max to answer questions for his own session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Seriously, and thank you to all the people who asked um, questions. So I'll start with the first. Oh, sorry, before I start with the question, uh, I think I should acknowledge uh, uh, my very senior colleagues, Mrs. Uh, Uche, and of course, uh, Mr. of course, Mr. Ayo is my friend and my brother. So like I always would tell the mentees, I don't think I have told this cohort of uh, mentees, but you know, when the magistrate is talking and the Supreme Court judge walks in, the magistrate has to pause and acknowledge. So, if you have a Zoom culture, like I always tell you, you, you can't get higher in the IP world in Nigeria. So you must take it as a, as, as a great advantage, please, that you have had access to Zoom culture. And it just reminds me, talking about Zoom culture, I know her firm, Alkanebode, actually, at the time, were one of the partners of them, I believe, FIFA, and I, I don't know if also the Olympics Committee. So they do a lot around ambush marketing. So I wanted to just throw this out. I think you guys should look at ambush marketing, like because the Olympics is on at the moment. So you need to, somebody should pick that as their topic for next week and uh, give a talk or do some research on ambush marketing. I believe it would benefit you a lot at this time that the Olympics are still on. And of course, with the benefit of uh, someone like Mr. Mokocha and Mr. Ayokunle, you'll be able to get really good insights on what uh, ambush marketing entails and what it's all about. So I'll move on to so kind, questions. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> It's always a pleasure. <laughs> so, so the first question is, um, if you register your rights earlier, say in Nigeria, does it give you advantage over someone who registers uh, later in time in your export market? So like I mentioned during my talk, it will depend on the type of right. So for instance, with patents, yes, you have an advantage because if I have my patent registered in Nigeria in 2015, and I want to export it to China, somebody says, look, you can't export it to China, because I registered the same patent in China in 2018, then I'm going to be able to apply to set aside this patent and show that look, this invention you registered in 2018 is not novel as at the time you registered in 2018 because I already registered it and disclosed that invention as far back as 2015. So that gives you an advantage. But for trademarks, it's not the same because trademarks are, um, uh, you know, uh, anytime you register your trademark, you get exclusive rights. So if somebody registers your trademark in China before you go into the China market, then you are, you are in a tight position. You might have to either enter an agreement to the person, maybe a cross licensing agreement to allow you use the trademark in China and also in return, give him the right to use the trademark in Nigeria. Or you enter you know, a simple licensing agreement or some sort of agreement, otherwise you get a new brand name for, for, your, for your product. So, um, so and that, that's, that underscores the reason why you need to have an IP management system in place you know, and do an audit, what to call a freedom to operate. So before you get into the Chinese market, a freedom to operate search or due diligence, they will let you know that look, they are already, there's already someone who has registered this trademark before you in, in China and you approach the, you know, and from what you see about the person, the business is really up and running. You could also check, for instance, if you has registered that um, trademark, he has not used it for five years, they can apply to have it canceled for non-use. So these are the things that your freedom to, freedom to operate 
uh, search would let you know about that market. So the question, the answer to the question is it depends on the IP, right? Sometimes you, uh, with patents, you get an advantage. With trademarks, you don't exactly get an advantage. The second question was, what are the systems of international registration? So there are quite a couple of them based on the IP right in question. So for instance, the, the Paris Agreement on a industrial property covers a trademarks, covers patents, covers designs to an extent. So it allows you a priority period. If you have registered your IP rights for save your patent in one country to go to another member country of the Paris Agreement and register within 12 months. So that is one of the systems you can use to get international registrations. Then of course you have things like the Madrid uh, system, which allows you for trademark purposes to register a trademark across um, many jurisdictions. You know, of course there are requirements. And like I said, none of these agreements take away the basic principle that IP rights are territorial, but it does allow you or facilitate your registration. And there are also of course what we call regional systems. So for instance, we have the African Regional Intellectual Party Office that allows you to register um, a mark potentially in 18, member countries within Africa. We have the OAP, which is a, for, mostly for Francophone countries, but has not just a registration system, but actually an IP system. So if you register a trademark in OAP, automatically it's applicable in, I think, the 17 or so member countries of OAP. Your same thing also with the EU trademark office, and then you have a few other such um, IP systems that allow you have a right in a number of uh, countries at the same time. Then the third question is, how does international IP agreements like the EFCFTA affect IP exports? So yeah, so the EFCFTA has as one of its, um, uh, uh, you know, one important protocol that is still under negotiation is the protocol on intellectual property rights. So uh, the negotiations are still on, but to a large extent from the fillers we get, it seems one of the, the objectives of that negotiation is to see how they can mainstream uh, as many African countries as possible into either a repo, which I mentioned earlier, or RP, any of the two systems. So if that works, that means that to a large extent, um, for an exporter from Nigeria, for instance, wants to export into Zimbabwe and South Africa, if both countries join a repo, then automatically you register your trademark with a repo, you designate Zimbabwe and South Africa, then you also have, you'll be able to get um, protection for your trademarks in those two countries. It will be similar also if the agreement concludes something acceptable around them. Um, patents as well. So uh, AFCFTA recognizes that, look, we want to encourage businesses to move across borders. So another important protocol, there's a protocol on, um, on competition law. So even if the protocol on IP law doesn't cover you fully, the protocol on competition law may allow you, for instance, to use uh, an action for unfair competition. Say, look, yes, I don't have a registered trademark in this country, but this guy apparently wants to prevent my products from entering into this country, and that is why he has started, he went to register this um, trademark, and also there are ways you could come under unfair competition as a, a competition law question to also gain some level of protection. So all this, of course, will depend on the final wording of the agreement. But we believe that in the spirit of AFCFT, they certainly want to create a continental-wide market. And if you want to create a continental-wide market, one of the things you must do is to ensure that you know players are able to move across borders fairly, and then, you know their IP rights are not prejudiced by players in other markets. So I believe the AFCFT will go a long way in harmonizing or creating some uniformity in the African uh, IP market. So thank you, Seriously, uh, I'm back to you. Mr. Max, so I can see Divine has a question. So Divine, please unmute and ask your question quickly so that we can proceed. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Max. I, I hope I got the name correctly. So my Question, um, I came across something while I was making my research on the US in the US jurisdiction um, about the exports. So from the analysis I got, it's possible that um, exports can actually occur, export of intellectual property can actually occur even without either sending your technology to a particular country. That means between an, in an office space, I can have um, a national from let's say China and any other country and then just our main interaction in Nigeria. Can we see at that point, do we have any laws that identifies that to say, okay, um, even in Nigeria, that is also possible that just by mere exchange of ideas in my office, we have also done exports. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, th thank you for that question. Yeah, it's a, it, it's, it's a possibility because 
we of course know we are in an interconnected world. The internet has made the entire world you know, to be one. So imagine I'm discussing with someone uh, you know, in my office, I, I, I reveal to him, um, say, an idea that is uh, maybe the subject of um, what I'm protecting through trade secrets in, in, you know, in the office, and he takes it off to China and begins to use it. So in that wise, yes, there's been some, uh, some, some level of um, an IP export into the, into, the, into the Chinese market. So I know, for instance, that between the US and China, there's been some, a lot of back and forth because in one of the accusations the US always has that the Chinese are always stealing their IP rights, taking back to China and getting protections unfairly against the, against the US company. So I believe they concluded some sort of agreement under either the Trans-Pacific um, Trans uh, Trade Agreement or one of those trade agreements between the US and China where they have insisted that China should give uh, equal protection for trade secrets as they, as they would be in the US and then some reciprocal rights. So that people could actually go to China from the US and say, look, you know, don't allow him to use this trade secret because he misappropriated it or he got it unfairly from a company. So something of that nature. I know in Nigeria, sadly, we still use the common law uh, um, trade secrets uh, regime. So there's no clear law on it. In the US, of course, they have a, a couple of elaborate uh, laws on trade secrets, for instance. We don't have the uh, same in Nigeria. But like I said, notwithstanding, you know, there are many ways, even on that the TRIPS agreement. The TRIPS agreement is a trade related aspects of intellectual property agreement managed by the World Trade Organization. Under that agreement, which almost all the countries or all the significant export markets in the world belong to, there are some level of rights you are able to get, at least if nothing else, under unfair uh, competition. So if you can show that, look, you know, this guy had some way of accessing my IP and is using it to unfairly compete with me, you might be able, you know, under certain circumstances to get some measure of protection. But otherwise, the safest bet is don't leave these things to chance. Get your proper plan in place and don't have to go back on the issue. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Ivan. All our guest mentors today for their presentation. So I'll quickly go to move on to Mrs. Uche so that she can add to the discussion. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks so much. What can I add? I mean, it's been um, a fantastic um, day today with the two presenters, um, Dezim and Mark, very interesting and then um, very thought provoking and value certainly added. So thank you so much. Thank you both. I just want to just say, you know, just I agree with Mark, you know, on the IP and export and the need to kind of look at the local laws and or maybe have local uh, representation. Even looking at what is happening with NAVDAC, NAVDAC will often ask for evidence of um, um, IP register ownership of trademark or patent or whatever uh, subject is, is relevant, you know, before they can issue product uh, registration uh, certificate or license. So it's very important that when you're looking at the exports, you're also looking to see uh, whether IP is protected, you know, whether you can also like Mark uh, rightly pointed, whether you can um, use your um, registration in one jurisdiction um, in the other jurisdiction where you intend to export your product, because as we all know, IP is a jurisdiction. So you need to look at what it's um, obtainable in certain jurisdictions before you venture to go. So that would be all for that. And also look at, I think he did mention in the paper that um, you look at local laws and then um, there are certain words that have negative connotations. So you need to be careful if you're exporting. You don't want to use some words, especially in China, there are two particular to use some words that they find offensive um, either with your packaging or your tagline. You know, so it's very important that you talk to lawyer, local lawyers and get local uh, representation. 
then on the IP assessment and uh, and um, IP evaluation. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that um, amongst IP um, right owners and corporations, there's always an ongoing discussion on what is this word? Because you need to know really the value of your intellectual property. And, um, and again, I want to put it out there uh, that there's no single correct value. Uh, so in other words, a person with the best analysis has the best answer. Because it, like you know, that with the approach is um, the uh, IP evaluation approach, there are three, there's the cost approach, and then there's the market and there's income. The cost is like um, you're trying to look at, you need to quantify the cost of replacement of data sets. But then how do you do that? IP is very unique. So it's very important to really be sure. And then the market, you're looking at the, the cost of similar products in market and compare maybe Samsung and Apple, you know. And then with the income, you're looking at the, um, the incremental cash flow. That again in the future, how can you really predict the future? So you, you know that with this is really, I think IP stakeholders, they continue to explore and look for the best way to really um, conduct IP evaluation because it's very difficult to do it with an asset that is so intangible. And um, I like also discuss the basics because it's very important that you really know the date of valuation because it's very important. If you value it today and then two years coming, the value might change. So you need to put the dates uh, of the valuation that helps you know, to um, decide and some of the basics also is looking at why valuation. So why do you need this valuation? Is it for buying and selling? Is it for MA? Is it for uh, tax purposes? Is it for financial statements and requirements? And then you look at um, infringement opportunities. I mean, how easily can this IP how easily can it be infringed? You know, Coca Cola's of this world, they have a zero tolerance for their brand. If you use Coke, you're in trouble. However, you use it, they will come after you. So, but there are some people, brand owners that are not vigilant, that are too relaxed. So, do you want to involve with this kind? So, you need to look at those when you're looking at valuation to see uh, the tendency to infringe, you know, and uh, also the, if the bankruptcy, and then you also look at, um opportunities is it a hot technology and then the robustness of the intellectual property i mean is it used in various jurisdictions you know these are the things you look at in, in valuation so it's really wide but you need to look at what works for you and then um, but it's just very important to know that your ip is what somebody the cost of your ip or the value of your ip is what somebody is willing to pay for it. So it's like, it's really um, an interesting subject today. And I don't think we can uh, have one answer for it today. It's something, it's an ongoing discussion. Uh, so that's my two cents. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, much Mark. Um, we also have um, Mr. Ayokuni Adetsula here. So I don't know if you would also like to say something. And you're looking very beautiful, Matt, today. Oh, you're, looking thank right. you. you're too kind. Thank you. And so are you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, just, just a quick one. I, I, I think uh, what I'll probably uh, put in um, from all the discussions uh, is the fact that it's always uh, easy to steal intellectual property than to probably steal other properties. 
because of the intangible nature. And uh, the, the individuals on the call, specifically the mentees, should also understand that uh, there, has, there is always development around the IP system. Um, just recently, um, from a regional perspective, Gambia just acceded to the Banju Protocol under uh, Aripo. And for years, they've been there. They've been attending everything. They have not, they did not accede. So basically, uh, I, I find out that people normally run in and say, oh, so all these countries, you can, you can, you can uh, protect your trademarks under a repo designating Gambia. This development usually come in handy and is always important for, for people to know. And, and, and sometimes uh, to the extent that one is looking at doing business across jurisdictions, uh, there, there are some thin lines that may, may give uh, an edge in some of these jurisdictions. Uh, somebody mentioned to say he wanted to register his trademark in ECOWAS. And then he looked around and I said, oh, okay, so I'm going to do a repo. I'm going to do some countries OAP. And along the line, I found out that also, there are some ECOWAS countries that are not in Aripo, that are not in OAP. So I know some people mentioned the fact that, oh, so when you are trying to register your trademarks in different countries, to the extent that um, trademark is territorial, uh, that, is, that is the bucket list that allows you to move across different jurisdictions by just going to some of the regional bodies. But then it's, it's also very important that uh, individuals take note of some of the countries that probably are in these regional bodies, but also have not acceded uh, to some of the protocols in these uh, countries. Sometimes issues like this could give uh, more of a heads up or could give an unfair advantage, if I put it that way, uh, to uh, individuals or entities uh, that are trying to do business uh, in other jurisdictions. So I, I think uh, other things, uh, the base have been covered alongside. Uh, I guess the other, the other thing that uh, Marx actually mentioned is something that is uh, important. Um, ambush marketing with Olympics. There are some issues that are, that come out of this Olympics that are well are, are, may not per se fall under the umbrella of ambush marketing. But if if it go if it was going to rain, then one way or the other, it may also be subsumed under ambush marketing. So, so it may be something that would uh, call for so much discussion, especially given the fact that uh, the Olympics is happening in the Asian region where one way or the other, there has, there has been uh, known cases of you know, IP uh, infringement. So I think those are my thoughts. And uh, with that, I want to uh, thank everybody that has come in. I, I believe that uh, these discussions are eye-opening. I myself, I, I had had something to, to pick in these discussions. And I hope that each person listening in has also found it very educative. Thank you very much.
so much, Mr. Yopoli, for your contribution to the discussion. So I'll quickly um, move on to the mentees. So um, we'll start with any group that is ready at all. You can just unmute. The representative can just unmute and then do a quick presentation. So group one, if you are ready, unmute. Okay, if group one is not ready, we'll move to group two. Good evening, group one. We are ready for presentation. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to um, find a way to share the screen. This is Okay, you can just go ahead while you try to share your screen. Okay. Please note that you have five minutes for your presentation. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, good evening to our guest speakers and our mentors. My name is Blessing Uchuma, and I'm the representative for Group One. And I'll be speaking on IP and export. Sorry, I'm still trying to share the screen. I don't know what it is with my phone, but I'll just um, go on with the presentation. Um, I must say that um, Mr. Max, Max has done a really great job talking about um, IP and exports. And I really learned a lot. I got to understand some of the things that I did not understand during the research for for the presentation and I really want to thank him for a job well done. Well, um, Mr. Max has basically said many of the things we have in our presentation. So I'll just be speaking briefly about two things, about um, the relevance of IP in exports and the common mistakes um, inventors and creators usually make when it comes to IP and exports. And when it comes to the relevance of IP in exports, First of all, IP helps to determine where to export. Enterprises with high value IP are reluctant to export to countries that do not respect intellectual property. I believe that um, when an inventor or an innovator seeks to export his invention into another country and realizes that such country does not have stringent laws and um, protecting the right of intellectual property owners, I believe he will be dissuaded from doing so. For instance, in Nigeria, there's um, such a high rate of piracy that um, many people in the movie industry may actually be discouraged from you know, coming to showcase their movies and hear and the rest here in Nigeria because they feel that they may not be able to make as much economic gain as they would if there were laws actually protecting, you know, their intellectual property and the, um, the, there was an enforcement of those laws. Sometimes it's not like those laws do not exist, but there's no enforcement. So you see people actually do whatever they like, even though the laws exist. Secondly, Consumer demand will be higher where a trademark is known and appreciated. Um, I don't know for every other person, but I feel like for a product like Indomie, uh, Indomie is far, I don't know, but I, I feel like it, it, it moves more market, let me use Nigerian term, than every other noodles in Nigeria. I know that there were many noodles in the past. We had Mimi noodles, Dangote noodles, and the rest, and we have people really trying to patronize, but somehow Indomie still leads. So as, as someone wants to export to other countries, you may consider, will, my, will I actually make economic gain from this, um, from this um, product? given that the country is, has, has already accepted one product, uh, will I be able to make as much economic gain as I want? Um, Third, the intellectual property is important in, is an important factor in attracting partnership. Mr. Max talked about cross-licensing agreements, you know, when there are issues as to, you know, registration of, um, trademarks and the rest, sometimes you can actually form partnerships with other people, other inventors who have similar products in, you know, the country of exports and, you know, actually sell your product in that um, country. Um, um, we also have 
um, packaging will also um, involve an array of intellectual property issues when it comes to your products, when it comes to packaging them, you know, the trademark and everything, you'd have to determine if there is another product in that country that has um, similar um, packaging, similar marks and the rest, and you have to find a way of dealing with that as a way of, as a way of avoiding um, issues with law enforcement and the rest. So I'll move briefly to, all, to the mistakes that people, that inventors and um, creators usually make when it comes to um, intellectual property and exports. Just like Mr. Marx has mentioned from the beginning of his lecture, intellectual property is universal, but the laws that protect them are territorial. Now, people might begin to assume that because you have protected your intellectual property in one country, it's the same in another country. It's also, even though there are regional agreements and conventions and international agreements and conventions that actually protect intellectual and property universally, it will still be good for you to um, follow the laws and the procedures for registration and protection of intellectual property in the country of um, exports. Um, um, secondly, also not using the regional or international protection system, just like um, um, Mr. Marx has mentioned, he mentioned some um, regional and international um, protection systems for intellectual property. Um, the international conventions include the Paris Convention for the Protection of um, Industrial Property, the Bern Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Work. Um, for the regional, we also have the African Regional Industrial Property Office and the organization African de la Property Intellectual, that is the OAPI. So we also have missing important deadlines for filing applications abroad. Sometimes you may assume that maybe because the laws are not so stringent in your country, you might want to carry the same attitude to other countries. Other countries are actually very serious with their intellectual property laws and you should try to register and um, meet up with the deadlines that they are giving. We also have not defining issues of ownership of IP rights when outsourcing manufacturing. There are times when the inventor is actually different from the company that actually manufactures these items. So in such um, situations, it is necessary that you draft agreements where it will be stated who actually owns the intellectual property rights, whatever is being manufactured. So in conclusion, we know that intellectual property is universal, but the laws that protect them are territorial. And until we get to a level where we have, you know, um, universal laws protecting them, it would be better to follow the laws of the country, um, intent, the country you intend to export them to. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry for not sharing the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Blessing. Um, so we'll move over to group two. Representative of group two is ready. Kindly unmute and make your presentation. You have five minutes. Thank you. Group two. Okay, if group two is not ready, we'll move to group three. Kindly unmute and make your presentation. Group three. Okay, group three is not ready. Then we'll move to group four. If group four is ready, kindly unmute and make your presentation. What's happening to Group two, three, four. Okay. So if you are not ready, then we'll move that to next week. So we we'll want to appreciate all our mentors for making our time to um, present today and share their insights on the topics today. 
or learned a lot and we really appreciate. Thank you, Mr. Max. Thank you, Mr. Dozier. Thank you, Mrs. Uche, Mr. Ayokunle. And thank you for all the mentees as well. Thank you to all the mentees as well that have made our time to be here today. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. So over to you, Mrs. Chris. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Dozier. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing with us. We sincerely appreciate it said thank you mr max also you have always been there for us and we are excited about the um, passion that you have to pass knowledge thank you so much mrs uche always looking beautiful always bringing value to the table we had too much <laughs> we are excited about you thank you so much ma thank you mr ayokunle thank you like the way you just carry this thing on top of your head like the way you just decided to take this as your own. We are, we are so excited. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you, Mrs. Uche, for recommending him to be one of the mentors. I also like to thank, thank our beautiful anchor for today, Sewese. Thank you so much for today. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. They are also anchors and they are here. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the mentees. Group two, three, and four, you people submitted your reports. So I don't know why you have not presented today, but I hope that you don't make this a habit. I wish everyone an amazing weekend. Thank you very much. <laughs> and take care of yourselves. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye, bro. Bye.